Um, I'm a physical therapist by day, super villain whenever I get a chance, and miniature painter um, for my relaxation. Um, started in 2002 to relax from PT school. Um, classic like D and D paint, uh, player at first, paints of the figures. Uh, started to play some war games because I wanted to have a reason to have 5,000 little toy models sitting around my apartment place. Um, found out I like just painting much better. And now I do a uh, competitive painting mostly at ReaperCon as one of my favorite shows. Um, but I do help out and teach out at HMGS, which is the Historical Manager Gaming Society um, as part of their hobby university schedule. Uh, so not entirely new to doing a digital class, but still, you know, it's Wild West Frontier for me. Well, my goal for the leathering class for you guys is to expose you to a lot of different techniques, um, especially in this digital format, and especially since we're recording this one. Um, so there's a lot of ways you guys can see how to do weathering and get a feel for it. Um, and that way you can choose out the appropriate technique for the effect that you want. Um, I find the biggest thing with weathering is you should have a wide range of techniques behind your belt. And reading about them is helpful, but seeing them applied is usually more helpful. Um, so colors wise, I do have a few colors out here just because I primed my um, dumpster green. So I have coal black, naga green, cat's eye green, and linen white. And then I have a selection of colors. Oops, I apologize. We probably should have started recording this before I start going to my colors, should I? Or do I need to hit the recorder? Or are you supposed to do that? Uh, I hit it as soon as you did your introduction. Oh, thank you. Uh, for um, other colors, I just need a mixture of browns. Um, you should have some yellow browns, some coal browns, some red browns. Um, those are all things that have a lot of variety to it. And those are mud, soil kind of colors. Um, both the Seer Weapon line and the Reaper line have plenty of fantastic colors for rust and mud into them. Um, so it's what you feel comfortable with, but I am not a paint devotee by far. That's whatever gets you the best results for what you want. As we go along through, if you're seeing anything in um, a technique that you want me to show again, or in particular you want to see, um, please put it in chat or at a fact that you're thinking about trying to apply. I'm just trying to go through a lot of different things today so that we get a good feel for everything. Um, the first one I'm going to prep is kind of a weird technique for peeling paint and it's going to take a little while for it to dry appropriately. So I want to make sure that I'm starting it first just so you guys can see it. It's going to involve wax paper, uh, Vaseline, and any acrylic paint. that way. And in this case, it's a nice big brush is probably best for it. I can tell this brush has been used for that before because it wants to retain its shape. Once you actually get your initial glove on, well, make sure you're painting this on the wax side of the paper. And we do want to get this as thin as possible. So I tend to find it easier to work in one direction. When you go back and forth, it tends to grab the paper and lift it on up. And if you do happen to be a brush licker, this will change your pattern real fast. Someone uh, asked in chat, wait, what are you doing with the wax paper? <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So I'm painting uh, Vaseline onto it. And you are fast. I thought I saw that at the corner of my eye when you just started saying it. So the thinner the layer, the better. 
The reason why we're doing this first is because we do have to wait for this technique to dry. So now I wanted to take my paint. In this case, it's going to be the river and leather. And I'm just doing the river and leather because off my green, um, it's going to be a good contrasting color. So I can be seen. Um, but this is a good technique for if you're doing paint, um, you want peeling paint versus a chipping kind of style of paint. And again, we want this thin as well. Now, what I do like about this is, so as long as that Vaseline is still kind of uh, wet or moist, you can save these. So I'll make some little swatches of them uh, for a product and use them two or three times so I get plenty of use out of them. I want to make sure that everything's nice and even coat once we're our color is down. And the reason why I'm starting with this first is I need to let this dry. So we're going to set this mad scientist experiment down for a side for a little bit. I'm let that fully dry. And once where it's dry, we're going to get back to this one. Um, but this is something you need to think about when you're doing weathering. Is some techniques take more time or more prep work than others. And do you want to spend that time for prep work? You know, if you're doing something such as salt, well, salt weathering, you know, you want to do that setup beforehand so we can get the effect in there. We'll talk about the salt weathering as well. Uh, but let's go to something a little more basic first. Um, let's talk about actually doing um, dents and scratches and bullet holes. Um, I think it's a good first place to start with weathering. And I really prefer faux battle damage as a method of doing that. Um, when we're doing faux battle damage, we're just using light to make the effect that we're looking for. And I'm going to switch over to my whiteboard. That did not label. So that should be my whiteboard. So when we have an object, we have a flat panel, what happens is all that light is going to reflect off. That's what gets our highlights the way we want them. But we have something that's dented. What happens is the light comes in, this area is going to be shadowed, and the lower edge is going to get the highlight that's going to come out and be reflected on off. Let's clean that up. So all we're going to do is when we're doing something that's got a scratch to it, is just pretend that the scratch surface, we're going to put the shadow on the top side, and then the bottom side, we're going to put the highlight. And this is going to simulate out scratches. It's also going to simulate out um, chipped paint. Um, and we can also do things like bullet holes with it. So. One of those class last time for a live event, um, the, the uh, my dumpsters get very busy very fast um, as the layers get affected and more and more techniques get put onto it. So I'm going to use these boxes to demonstrate the technique, and then we'll go back into the dumpster and show how we can start layering those effects. Um, but I just want a surface that you can see a little easier first. So for a scratch, I want to take a super dark paint, such as a black. And then just make a very thin line. Then underneath of that, I want whatever highlight color I'm going to use. So I would normally paint this all the way forward through it first. I want to make the top of the um, question mark the top of the box. Now all I'm going to do is come in. Make a very fine line under the underside. Let's make that my camera to focus a little bit better. Okay. 
There we go. I'm going to need a little more color to it, or it's not bright enough. You just mix a little bit more white into it. I draw the line. That gives us that feeling of a scratch. For something like bullet holes or dings, you make some rough shapes. We're going to use something like chip paint. Then we're going to highlight the underside. And if you take it out, it's not a big deal. We can't get that line straight. You can just come back in with a black. And put it back on top. That's going to give you that feel of a chip piece. Now, if we're doing something like chips, we're going to do something that obviously has a little bit of randomness to it. And the easiest way to find to get a very random pattern is blister foam. So we're not, we don't want that hard outside edge of the blister foam because um, it usually comes with nice square pieces. I want the internal stuff. I'm actually going to wind up pulling and peeling it. That stuff is the toughest stuff I have. So this has a lot more surface to it. So I can actually gather it on up and tap it. And then we're gonna just pretty much like we're doing dry brushing where we're tapping out the excess and tapping on the excess. And I'm gonna find wherever that wear pattern would be at. So on boxes in the corner uh, for vehicles where the foot rest would be at and just touch it to it. That's gonna give me some more randomized chipping versus if I do it by hand, I'm gonna get some very predictable patterns to it because my hand wants to move in certain ways over and over again. And what I can also do, let's put a few down and get a few little ones that I don't like or I do like, I can either wipe them out. Or if I wanna try and expand them something out, I can actually take my brush now and expand the chip if I want to. And so on those smaller chips, I'm just gonna come back on through. Take my brush. I don't need to get every one, but you do want to get the lion's share because you can help more sell the effect. You have too many that are just small chips that you don't have anything with. So that gives our feel of chipping. If you are a non-metallic metal kind of person, This works very well with even armors and such. They give them kind of a beaten look. So you have a lot of options there with that. Um, on this particular bust, um, there's a lot of texturing to it, um, just the way it's sculpted on out by Jason. So it actually has these little dents and chips to it. Um, you can add additional ones and it helps to make them blend even better because now you have some real with some um, uh, faux damage, uh, which hides things much easier. Uh, effects like claw marks. My desk has so much hair on it. Um, are just going to be linear lines next to each other. And you do want different lengths. I'm going to get most things. Oh, no problem. Let's actually do this. I 
I'm gonna drink down my palate a little bit too. Hey, Dave. So the top I'm just gonna leave blank. That scratch is gonna be a shadow area. So that's naturally gonna be the indentation where that shadow wants to come into it. And it's kind of like now I'm talking metals. Um, we're emphasizing where the light's going to be. So it's going to make that fake effect to it. Um, we're looking for highlights to be on top. And now since that highlight's on the bottom, it's gonna register as, as, as that scratch or that damage on the inside to it. So you don't have to do anything else different with that line. Um, on the top of an item, so let's say we're doing the square boxes on top here. So this depends on where I'm going to put my sunlight light at. So actually, that's a good reason why I do these cases. So let's say I have in the sun coming from this direction, light coming from this direction, all my scratches, fast scratch here. Are going to have the line here. If let's say I just link it like a center light here, because it's highlight, let's say it's high noon kind of territory, I would have to do them as radial patterns around. But that would take some more extreme highlighting to do it. Does that answer the question well enough, Jeff? Yep. Yeah, so it still depends on the light source too. You're going to pick an angle from that light to come from. So even on. Um, Even on the top of something. Like the mecca here. So even if it's a flat top to it, the light source is still going to have either a directionality to it, either coming from one side or if it's straight on top, it's going to favor a little bit. If you're having a pure on top where it's there's no favoring of it at all. Um, the center point is going to become your highlight point, especially for something shiny like that. So the shiny section would be in here. And then you would have to do your scratches radially away. Because the highlight section will still be, the light will still be shining more here. That far side would become the lower side. Okay. For something such as bullet holes, you can make dots. I'm also trying to make paint fast, that was ruins good paint. It's still wet. I'm just going to do a little bit of an underlying U to that. I gave me my bullet holes for fake fire foe damage. Things I want to keep aware of if anyone's fired, you know, armory before. Um, most guns tend to walk on up. So I either want a rising pattern or I want a falling pattern. It just helps to add to the effect of multiple shots being fired. Um, if they're in a line, 
it winds up feeling less um, gunfire and more something's been pierced. So just thing to be aware of. So on our dumpsters, taking some foam, and really start putting some chipping. Really, around the handles, around the front area, around edges where we can see some dents or chips into it. Remember, color is all dependent on what your highlight color would be. So if you're doing a red dumpster, it'd be a little bit different. If you're doing a bright purple dumpster, it'd be a little bit different. And you're going to follow that shape that you put in. And what's cool about this too is this technique works out well for things like scratches or cuts on people. Um, the only thing to be aware about is the position that the model is in. Um, so like a model that's raising their hand in victory, which is this one. If I put a scratch on her hand or a cut on her hand, I have the blood coming down. It's obviously her hand wasn't in the air the entire time. Um, enough for the blood to flow downwards. But what happens is since we're looking at that figure in that moment in time, um, it's very important to make sure that we're referencing which way is it going in that model at that moment in time. Um, so probably her hands down is blood a little bit. So the blood would be going more towards the knuckle side of things. Um, however, when she raises her hand, that'd be going the wrong direction. Our brain doesn't like that. Um, so whatever you're doing it, this kind of cutting or faux damage for like cuts, um, if you have a little bit of blood, make sure you're pulling it in the right direction. Um, that way it feels more comfortable for it. So the next thing we can do is with these browns is layering a little bit of mud effect down or grime. So for mud and such, you do want a couple of different browns. In this case, we're gonna continue using the wearing leather. Uh, I'm just going to grab some polished leather. There is no hard, fast, what browns you want for it. It just depends on the mud and the leather, the mud and the leather, the mud around where you are at, where you're interested in it. Um, I went for a emerald hunt in, I think it was South Carolina at one point in time. Um, and it was a heavy kind of red clay. Um, doctor standing in a river trying to uh, um, pan for emeralds the entire day. Um, everything for those pair of jeans uh, were red from the waist um, down, um, knees down, a little high for the waist down, I wasn't waiting that deep. Um, so it just depends on what kind of colors you wanna see. Um, if you're in a drier landscape, you're gonna have a little bit more of the higher color. If you're in a wetter landscape, you're gonna have more of the darker color. Uh, so in World War II, a lot of soldiers were trained in camouflage at that point in time, but soldiers were very specifically told not to put any mud on their helmet. And the reason is mud as it dries gets lighter in color. Um, I'm sure we've all seen this in the equipment before. So I'm going to take my polished leather and bring it down to more like a glazer and a wash consistency. And I'm going to leave kind of a little too thin. Messy kind of puddle to things. And I'm just letting it slide on up and building up. I do want it a little bit on the higher side. 
because I want to lower the effect down into here for the darker colors. And I can grab something such as the earthen brown. My brush is still wet. I can even grab a little bit of wetness from the that one. I come down and mix that in. And then where that wettest mud is at, I come back with my darkest color. Come in. I want to pull some of that. I can always just take a wet brush or a damp brush. I should say wet brush. The brush is damp, but not a lot of water to it. And just pull the color and muck it around a bit more. That gives it a really rough form and a rough edging to it. I'm not drying up. And that gives very much things like the edges of dumpsters or dirt. So we have that wet mud that's still wet and still clumped a little bit. And then we have that drying effect as it comes on up. It starts pulling the color out of it. And this can be layered over and over again too. So you start getting more depth to it. So you can keep pushing that direction more and deeper. Um, adding things like reds are important or can that help that out too. Um, yellows are good. I prefer like a yellow going down into a, like a red tone. Um, that's just more aesthetically pleasing to me. Um, but you can do whatever you're comfortable with. Um, this was actually a demonstration one. I probably wouldn't leave like a hard edge line like this. I mean, I want it all the way back here, but at least taper it off a bit. I'm just doing a quick version of this versus the thin as I had before. So I hope you can see how having it on both sides a little bit looks much better than just having it flat on one side. We have two sides to it. It just gives that extra feeling of that corner. Sorry, which way we need to rotate. Sorry guys, it's mirrored on my side, which is very weird to me. So that can just change that up and you can change the color. It looks like I used a more of a walnut brown when I demonstrated this last time. I can even mix in a little bit of black into my brown and darken it up a little bit more to try and make that match again out. We want to continue with the stippling effect that we just learned from before. We can actually use that to apply rust and such. So we can keep our browns. Um, only some rust is very bright red. It depends on how oxygenated it is. Okay. So, uh, first way we're gonna do rust is a simpling method. Um, it's a little quicker, especially for gaming pieces um, and more survivable for gaming pieces. And that really just I leak all over the place. Uh, so this is rust red. From secret weapon. Um, Justin McCoy likes his rusts and such. So most of his colors are made specifically for that kind of stuff. Again, it doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, who makes those as long as it's a good color for it? Um, go by the color, not the name on the bottle. That's a little bit of a brown rust. Let's get something a little brighter. Let's go for a blood red. I'm going to grab a pair of tweezers for this so I can try and get my fingers out of your guys' view as much. So I can just take my blister foam, put some of that color onto it, and let's go for this under area in here. So I can start patting it down a little bit. I am looking to peak the paint a little bit. Because not only do we want to put the effect of rust in, we also want some texturing from it as well. And then I can grab a little bit of red. And 
and tap it in. If I get too strong with it, I can just start grabbing it and layering out more areas. And come back in and tone it out. There's someone in QA that asks how Russ collects in crevices. Yep. So I'm just going to push that up and get that into that crevice a bit. If I needed to, I can actually start doing some stippling with a brush if it's a very small crevice. Uh, I'm using blister foam for my sponge, Mike. And hey, hi, Marie. So I'm going to poke that guy. I can do some just basic kind of stippling to get more tight inside crevice I want to. Oh, with the gravity effect, the, the pulling down? Yeah, we can get that one for you. So a couple of ways we can do that is once we have a little bit of texturing in there, uh, we can do a nice thin brush, nice thin paint. And then I can actually take the brush and pull the color. I just want to come from someplace that's in that territory and just pull that color. And as you see, I start approaching my scratch over here. This is where I start having to be a little bit smarter with things because as I pull that color over into that scratch, that's faux battle damage. So I need to pull either into that color and into my shadow and not come back out of it. No more wetness. So I pull down. I just want to come to where I have my dark line at. Mm -hmm. Okay, you a little bit better. Oh. Oh. So as I come down, why it disappeared in my darkness? If I come over it, I'm going to wipe out my scratch effect. So you do need to be aware of where your different effects are at. Um, that way you can feel comfortable in what range you're working with, so you can modify things as appropriate. So some other ways we can actually do that um, dragging effect into it. Um, let's talk about oil paints a little bit. So if I start to bring out the oil paints, And you can tell it's been since the last show because the oil paint doesn't want to open. Um, so uh, this was in the discount section at my local AC Moore. Um, people crushed them up the tubes a little bit. That's more than fine for me. This is more than the oil paint I need for the rest of my lifetime for doing weathering. Um, you do have to use a different thinner medium though. So I am using white spirits. If you are a brush licker, now is a fantastic time to stop. I 
I think we'll just switch to a different brush. Just so I can keep track of which one has the white spirits on it. So all I'm doing is just grabbing a little bit of the oil paint, and I mean a little bit of the oil paint. Hopefully the blue will show up. Let's do it this way first. So a uh, burnt sienna is really good for oil effects and such, um, but I'm just gonna put a little bit of boop onto my model. So we can see a little dot of oil paint that I just put down. I'm going to clean off my brush. And this method is very much painting by subtraction. So, I'm going to wipe off the extra off my brush just so it's damp. And with that damp brush, I am subtracting out what I don't want for that streak and pulling it down as I go. If that streak's too strong or too thick, I just re dampen my brush and subtract more from the sides of it. Clean off my brush and pull that streak through even more. So depending on the material that you're seeing for it, you're gonna get different colors. Um, you'll see a lot of um, blues and greens, uh, like ships. Um, that's the algae, you know, as the deck gets washed over a bit. Um, with uh, machines, you'll find um, oranges and reds and um, burnt siennas. Um, that's the rust and the grime coming into it. Um, and I really like the burnt sienna, especially on um, vehicles because it makes such a good grime because essentially that oil paint is mimicking oil. Um, if I get a multitude of colors, I get a little red and put some dots of red around. Grab a magenta. Maybe not grab a magenta because that's sealed shut. I'm gonna go back through and open these up. So let me go back to having shows again. I'm not, all my paint's not sealed shut. Some burnt umber. And in tank modeling and historic modeling, they'll refer to this as a filter. Because we're going to leave some like just thin lines behind. So I'm going to let my brush on out. And pull it across the model. It's gonna look like hell at first. But I'm gonna wet my brush and pull it across. I'm just gonna keep thinning out that paint. Clean my brush, take off the excess, and very much painting by subtraction. So what gets left behind is this filter of grime. And you can pick as many colors as you want to. Um, if it was just something green, I might add more reds to it to get a more of a complementary scheme to things. Um, if this is really good on rocks um, and stones, because um, we can get all those kind of different mineral looks to it. Um, castle walls are a good place to do that with. Um, So 
So we can get all the kinds of those different colors that we want to and those effects that we want to in. And the nice thing about this is you can do this over and over and over again. Um, the, the oils will dry over the acrylics and vice versa, it's just a matter of how long time it takes. So when this is fully dry, I can do acrylics back over on top of it if I wanted to. Uh, it's just a matter of how long it will take to dry. Um, I do like a lot of the oil paint streaking because if I don't like it, I can go back and redo it or subtract it still for a little while. Um, but I'll set this up someplace else and let it dry for a while before I start to work with it again. Um, but as far as the thinner, um, any thinner that's appropriate for oils is fine. So it depends on how thin you have it, Jeff. Um, so the thinner you have it, the faster it will dry. Um, typically within a day at how thin it is, um, I'll have it dry. Um, I've had it in Texas where I've actually had it dry that day, uh, probably more towards the end of the day versus the beginning of the day. Um, I'm in New Jersey with um, some moisture air and um, uh, some sea salt to it occasionally, depending on which way the wind is blowing from the shore or not. So I tend to get um, a lot of drawing time out of my stuff. I've never had a breaking down a mini problem, uh, both in plastics, resins, and uh, metals. Um, things I would watch out for is if you're doing something like uh, rubbing alcohol or spirits, um, not mineral spirits, ethanol, that kind of stuff like that. Um, but you're using so little of it. And once you're kind of done, you're done. You're not really going to be touching it too much or playing with it too rough. And I'm going to put that away, away, so I don't put my hand into it later. When I teach this class live, I make one person assigned to make sure I don't sit on my plate, plate of oil paints. I see where stuff is dry. I think it's dry enough to make an attempt. Okay. So we're going to put this away here for now. So essentially, what we did with the wax paper is we put the Vaseline on one side. And that's going to make it so that the drying paint doesn't bond well to the wax paper. Uh, between the Vaseline and the wax portion of things, this paint is going to be not want to hold on to this side. And what we're going to use is either a matte varnish or gloss varnish. I really how I brought the pokey tool to say. And you can drip the paint down, you can splatter it around, um, you can do any of the effects that you want to try and get done. Um, I like this for peeling paint on walls. So I'm just tapping it down, kind of joining the area I want it to go into. And then I'm just taking my wax paper and pressing it down. and holding it down. Uh, thin spots make thin areas, thick spots make thicker areas. So when you press it down, so it's gonna be a bigger area than you think it's gonna be. And we're gonna leave this be for a few moments. Um, hopefully you can see the and not shiny, but the underlying wet spot where that matte varnish is underneath, or the gloss varnish in this case is underneath. What happens as that dries, that varnish is going to make a stronger bond between the model and the glue, the glue, the model and the paint. So when we go take this off, it's actually going to peel that paint and give a texture and a layer to it. 
Um, but we're gonna let those dry out a little bit first. As again, I have a little more of a humid environment, so this may take a few moments for me. Let's talk some leathering pigments. So, uh, leather pigments come in many different forms. You can actually get yourself some chalk pastels um, and use those as weathering pigments. You can. I just want to put a piece down of a uh, paper before I start breaking out the pigment so I don't have to try and get them out of my stuff later. Um, a lot of times I'll actually start prep a piece of newspaper or a uh, circular flyer for it. Um, and what I'll do is I'll actually fold it in half and fold it in half the other way. Well, that leaves me this little divot square in the middle of the cross. So what happens is when I'm done using everything, I can just fold everything together, fold everything together. All my pigments stay down here, all my loose ones, I can throw it away without making a problem. Um, typically, I would wear a mask while doing this, just mostly because I have a fear of sneezing one day and driving this all across my paint desk. So in weathering pigments designed for weathering application, um, it's just the ground pigment portion of things. There's not a lot of binder or applicator to it. Um, if you see the weathering pigment kits that actually have like a little like, um, almost like makeup uh, a paint tool to it, there's a binder that helps to make that a cake. Um, I much prefer when it's loose this way so you can do what you want. My brushes never really uh, get to retire. Um, they just go to worse and worse areas until they eventually die. Um, when they do die, I make them into sculpting tools. So uh, my brushes never get to retire. Um, but having some um, um, cracked out kind of brushes are really handy for this kind of application. And you can do things such as have medicine cups. So you can just try and dump them out into the medicine cup or use what you need. You can pull from the container itself. But the basic techniques we have for it is either a stippling technique where you're actually pushing down on the model. And then as we zoom in better, run around on the table. And let's bring you one closer. So I can press down on the model. That's going to deposit the weather pigment on. And I hope you can see that it. Um, Fighting with cameras is always so much fun. So hopefully you can see that there's some texturing left behind as well. Um, this isn't typically a method I really prefer for gaming. Um, just for the sheer fact is that's something that really can't be touched. Every time it is touched, it's going to wipe away. Um, and then you're gonna get less and less of that a weathering effect that you wanted, um, staying on it. Um, we can also burnish it in, which is taking that brush and rubbing that weathering pigment in. This is gonna give a lighter, dustier effect than when we stumble into it. You can also just pick it up and let it fall onto it. So that will stay behind. And that gives you even more texture. So 
So what we're going to have to use is a pigment sealer. Um, so if we're using a sealer such as uh, aerosol sealer, um, what's going to happen is it's going to blow it away. So what we can do is we can either pull back further from it so the uh, propellant doesn't actually hit the uh, model. Um, so you just get the sealer to fall into it. Um, several companies do make a pigment fixer. Um, I prefer something that's very liquidy, such as this. I'm going to test my strength today. Should test to see if it sealed itself shut or not. The nice thing about the sealers is they kind of like reaper bottles, but they kind of dry out a little bit in that tip. They like to seal themselves shut. Uh, problem is right now, I've been trying to open it without smacking my camera. Nope, I'm not gonna fight it. Um, I'll try and get a tool on it in a second. Um, but the method we're gonna use to actually use that to seal it is we're actually going to use a very liquidy version of it, um, dip our paintbrush into it, and then tap the edges of the pigment. And that pigment's so dry because it's legitly a powder, um, it's going to wick the sealer into it. Um, as it wicks the sealer into it, I'm gonna try it one more time because I really do want to show it to you guys. Nope. I'll give myself tendonitis, good Lord. Um, as it wicks it into it, it's gonna actually make the pigment disappear a little bit. I might show the effect with water at least. Nope. Won't do it today, of course. Nope. Sorry, I don't want to see flow because of the air today. The uh, sealer has just a little less flow than water does. Uh, more viscosity to it, so it's going to flow a little bit easier. Uh, yes, you can actually apply the adhesive first down and then apply it to the model. Um, you won't be able to get the dusty effect in. Um, you're going to get more of the textured effect in, um, just because you can't have that adhesive down and then dust across it, you get the powder effect, because you're going to get runny streaks kind of look to it. Um, but what you can do, um, which is an effect that I like quite a bit, is build up like a mud effect with water. So I can actually take that powder, wet my brush and push it around a little bit. And what I'm gonna get is this lumpy clumpy mess on my brush. And I can push that in And take some of that powder stuff and push it across. I get very much a textured mud kind of effect. Yeah, ISO works good too. Um, ISO I tend to use more for um, thinning when I'm going to do a wash with the pigments. So you guys will do a pigment wash as well. So if I add even more water to this or ISO, I can actually mix it up and make a little wash out of it. And what happens as that dries, the pigment powder will slip right out again. Um, so I notice with water, you're going to get a weaker bond, but you're going to get more of a powdery effect with it. Uh, with ISO, you're going to get a stronger bond to the surface, which will hold well, especially for pigment washes. Um, but you're going to have less of a powdery after effect to it. It's going to be more of um, just the color that's in there. Um, so I tend to use like the ISO for things like rust, um, things I want to grab a texture and really hold it well. Um, 
things like dirt and mud, I'm going to use more of the water effect because I get a powdery version for it, from it. So you get a couple different versions that way. And you ever see seeing some of that stuff start to dry like that wet or mud effect I was talking about before. So it can dry very quickly and get that good texturing to it. Um, so especially when we're doing things like pigments, we want to try and push the texture up from the model uh, versus just painting it in. So the more texturing we give to a model, so the more we can layer things like peeling paint, uh, mud and rust, uh, chipping, um, the more we can get that weathering effect portion coming on into things. And the colors really make less of a difference because the colors depend on what you're working on. Um, if I'm using something like um, a chemical truck, the chemicals are going to have a different effect with paints and other materials then, so maybe very different. Um, the thing to be aware about, though, is don't get too weird. Um, so we're used to seeing reds, we're, start, we're used to seeing browns. Um, however, if you have an alien planet with like super blue earth, um, doing a um, blue mud um, can be very throwing um, just because we're so not used to seeing that. So despite the fact it might make sense in your story or the examples that you're using, you may have to back off a little bit um, to make sure that it's acceptable as a realism portion of things. Um, also knowing how messed up do you want to make a thing or how dirty do you want to make a thing is also viable and important as well. So you don't want to push it till it's wreckage, um, but you want to make sure that it's comfortable with what you're working with. And we should be dry over here now. Yep. So I'm not sure you saw me lift up and that already peeled, popped on off. So we're going to peel that on off. And that's going to give me my chip paint effect. And the nice thing about that is that's actually chipped paint. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see it well enough, but I even have a little bit of the paint being lifted up here. So that's another degree of texturing. And I can use multiple different colors as I did this color last time I taught this. Um, if I let this dry and come back with a different layer, and re put in more matte finish or more um, gloss coat and stick another color to it, I can have multiple layers of peeled paint. Um, so good stuff for something haunted or something um, um, that's been reused or repurposed, fencing on a diorama or a scene, um, um, a post that maybe people have been you know, painted and repainted over again, seen more weather. Um, so just some good options that way that you can use that for. So the last material I'd like to talk about, and then we'll have some more specific questions, is uh, weathering pencils. Um, I want to tell you guys not to be a sucker like me and pick up things called weathering pencils for weathering pencil purposes. Um, colored pencils work quite fine. Um, uh, watercolor pencils work quite fine. Um, these are re purposed and relabeled coloring pencils and water pencils. Um, and they sell them to you for more. Uh, you don't get much Vaseline left behind. Uh, so pretty much goes off fairly quickly. I'll eventually vaporize for it. Um, if I'm in more of a rush, because I have to do something fast. Let's say I'm at a show when I'm doing a comp piece and I really want to do it. Um, I will cheat and use Vicks Vapor Rub. Um, however, with Vicks Vapor Rub, I can't store it. Um, eventually, that Vicks Vapor Rub is going to. Soft pastels work quite fine. And to be honest, they give them to you for a better price um, than they do this stuff for. 
color. Uh, this is a, a chalk pencil, essentially. Um, that I like much better. What I do like about this technique in this method, though, is um, for rougher surfaces, it really is just drawing in your color. So I can take it and mark my lines into the things. Let's see if I grab a different color so you guys can see a bit stronger. So I don't want something super sharp as far as a point goes because um, that's going to scratch my surface. But I can use the side of the pencil to layer in some effects to it. Um, my favorite, favorite, favorite trick with this, though, uh, I don't have something I can put water into, I guess. Yeah. Let's see if I can reach it. One more medicine cup. So one of my favorite tricks, though, is actually taking the feels the word palette um, pencil and holding it to water for a second. And hopefully, you guys are seeing the very soft lines that are coming off of it. Um, that weakens the. And I can get much more off of it this way. And then since it's water soluble, that means I can come back with a paint brush and a damp brush and push that color around if I want to. I can get more things like a running rust if I want to. I can take that damp brush and pull that color down. Um, I can push more color around into areas if I want to do more stone that has a hue to it. Um, I can layer colors. If it's a model such as this one with actual like um, pinning your holes into it, I come back with my white and I scratch it along the edge to help highlight. Where those ships and dents are at. Uh, so I can combine that with all those different techniques that we've been talking about already. Trying to push how far things go. Um, I can, and this is where I want to really teach a lot of um, techniques versus an individual, like, hey, this is how you do this portion of things. Because now I can do something such as um, take a pencil and draw graffiti on it. Um, let's do a rough. Like kind of rough Greg was here kind of thing. And then what I can do is I can add some color on top of that. So that was the first piece of graffiti that was on it. Someone came by and scrubbed it on off or weathering took it on off. Um, I can put a peeled paint effect onto it as if someone tried to paint it on top of it. Now the paint's been peeled since. Um, so you have a lot of times where you can think about the different layers in advance. Um, so you make decisions about how do you want this look? And how do I need to layer this to make these different effects work in the right order? Um, last question is, is it worth me making the effects work in the right order? So if I need something that needs to be pristine first, I need to make something peel away on it. Or if it's newer, let's say it's a new sign and it's the first layer of paint that's peeling from it. I need to finish painting everything first because that all that other paint would be still very fresh and very new. Um, if I want a mecha figure to look mecha and not like a piece of wreckage, 
I need to keep enough of it new and shiny and just put chips in certain areas where we would see combat and surface at. So it depends on how weathered you want something to be or how destroyed is something wants to be. Um, so looking at what the story you want to tell in weathering becomes a very important factor. Um, you want to push it to the point where you feel you've uh, shown the passage of time, but not so much that you've left um, an unusual piece of hunk of junk as well. Let's see here. If I come back in here. Let's do a little bit. Like that. Again, that's why I do like this with the wax paper because I can do it several times. Unless things peel, just be a little different each time. I'm gonna try and fold it for a few moments. Um, and if you're doing weathering, you'll never come away with very clean hands. So if you're a little OCDH like me, um, I'm constantly running and washing my hands after I do weathering. I'm afraid of touching anything else afterwards. Uh, more because I don't want to get the weathering stuff on everything else. Uh, while waiting for this drought thoroughly. Um, is there any piece of equipment you guys are wondering about? Any um, piece of machinery or person that you're trying to weather on through um, that you want to have ideas about and you want to discuss at this point in time? While my fingers are trapped holding on to this, we can talk about it. Okay. Um, so let's see, let's see if this peels on off. Not quite yet. Got a little bit going on, but I didn't quite get all of it. Um, okay, so plate weathering, weather billboard. Let me do this. Move it over here. Um, so Jeff, my first question for you is, how are you making your billboards? Are you actually printing the paper for the signage on them, or are you doing something different first? Okay, so the logo wings both on it for the 3D billboard. Okay, clean slate, okay. Um, so any of that weathering that you're putting onto it, my personal preferred method for that would probably be taking something as, um, okay, fishing knowledge. Making cloth look dusty and steel plate weathering. Okay. Um, so for a, a billboard thing, so you have that large flat object portion to it. Um, I would A, do some of the chipping and layering like this kind of stuff goes for it. Um, but one of my favorite tricks I used to do is in the printer is print out um, papers, uh, signs and posters and that kind of stuff like that. Um, you'd be surprised how small um, laser jets and some printers can get into as far as detailing goes. Um, bring that onto the, the poster portion of it um, using either um, matte medium or gloss medium and lay it flat onto there. And I really don't care if it bubbles any or doesn't hold well, because um, what I want to go back doing then is with a very wet or damp um, paintbrush, I'm going to start trying to muck up the paper. So it starts to tear and fold and thin up places so I can start peeling it away. Uh, would be the combination of events I go for for as far as billboard goes. Um, if I'm painting it um, and I have a painted logo onto it, I probably would do the chipping um, patterning onto it at that point in time. Um, when you say steel plate weathering, are you looking at... Um, Big flat objects, uh, things with bolts to it. I just dropped the question portion of things because I dropped that. Okay. Um, so I don't have anything I can use right demonstrate in front of me. So for the work vehicles, I probably would go the oil method, um, grabbing that top edge with that oil. And then pulling the streaks down 
across the surface. So it drags on in and then mix that with the um, uh, stippling method. Fair enough. I just want to make sure it was a plate that way versus a different portion of things. By putting that oil underneath of it, you're going to get a darker highlight. And that will actually let you pull that color through in multiple locations. So it lets you vary the length in that portion of things. Um, the thing to be aware about when you hit a plate with bolts or rivets, it's not going to go over top of the bolt. It's going to go around the bolt because it's still water wants to flow in the easiest method possible. So, you got right here. Okay. Um, so, weathering boats. Uh, Cassie, are we talking about, uh, I'm assuming like the smaller uh, fishing vessel kind of stuff like that? Are we talking fantasy fishing boats made out of wood? Or are we talking like modern fishing boats, steel and plate? What about family? Okay. Um, so, honestly, what I would do is those boats are going to be repainted over time. So, I would take that chip uh, or peel paint method and come back through. Uh, something a little rougher than this. You don't want too rough because you don't want to scratch off all the surface of things. But I'm taking a soft sanding stick. And I'm just trying to peel. Look at this up. There we go. So we can get an additional layer appealing to the boat. So it's been painted and repainted before. And we can show signs where that has been sanded and try to be peeled again or worn away. So we get a little texturing because of scratches and scrapes. We get some peeling paint effect. Um, we can also do the wax paper method. And instead of making sure it's nice and level, the purpose is leave some streaks into it. So barnacle answer you may not like because I would actually sculpt the barnacles. The barnacles are a texture that, um, um, you would actually have to implant into it. Um, but salt line is just leaving a corroded line onto it. So we'll show that in a second here. Um, but let's say I wax paper this down. I'm just gonna use the wax on here first. So I don't leave as thin of a, as nice of a pattern to it. And I let the Vaseline or wax drag that around. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I don't leave as smooth of a layer down as I did over here and just let that break apart a little bit more and keep my directionality the same. You're going to get more of a scraping effect from that. So it gives that boat cutting through that water portion and the paint's kind of peeling away effect. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to answer Tish's question uh, as far as an idea first, and I'll take another piece out, and then we'll actually try and see if we can make that effect look the way you want it to look in a second. Um, I think this is a fun way because it shows that there's no one way of doing that. Um, uh, so Tish, um, Trish, sorry, Trish. Um, I would actually use dry brushing. Um, so either I can use the weathering pigments um, and go back and forth over the model and do that um, um, burnishing effect. Um, and I would get that dustier effect like over here. Um, or if you do a very thin and very light dry brushing. Now, when you do dry brushing, typically we're trying to get that over on just highlight areas. But in this case, I'm actually going to follow the contour of the model. I don't know that pencil on my knee here. I'm going extreme here, so bear with me. So if I heat that and dry brush over the contour of the model, I'm not just using the tip of the brush, I'm using the whole side of the brush. I can get that very fine layer of green to something. So now it just becomes a matter of picking out the correct color for your dust. And even doing it enough times that gives a dusty effect to things. And that's the biggest complaint with dry brushing as a, a just a simple method itself. Um, dry brushing tends to leave things look looking dusty. Let me get these guys out of the way. And I want to see how well a sloppy. Last thing that's what it's going to do for that boat portion of things. And it makes a big difference on whether you're using the tip of your brush or the side of your brush a lot of times. So don't be afraid of using the side of your brush, guys. The, the whole brush is the tool. You can tell when a brush has been used for in Vaseline, at least to pull that direction. And this is why I like to do a class where I'm really just talking a lot about different techniques, um, because there is no one right way to get the effect that you want. A lot of it is playing around with techniques like, okay, well, if I do it this way, I get this. Um, but if I remodify it or redo it, you know, in a direction or sloppy or, you know, in a, a less clean method. All I'm doing is just painting it down and not really worrying about being as even with my coating on them. Take a drink of water. or make this the panel of our boat at this point in time. If I could do it like that, I could also 
to a little bit of my blister foam. Go down and pull it across. So there's different amounts in different areas. Hopefully you guys aren't hearing me blow into my microphone. I'm trying to just get this to dry just a little bit faster. I think the real trick on this one is all the directionality to it. So I'm mostly using my nail and helping it peel off the backing a little bit. Yep, it's gonna be good. So I did much thinner this time. I also used my nail to break it off. And I'm gonna take it in a direction. So Cassie, is that a look that you're finding acceptable for your wood green on your boat? So the scrapes have a little more directionality to it, yep. So it has a little directionality to it, it has a little more flow to it. And guess what? I can do more boat with this thing if I wanted to. Heck, we can even layer that effect. Wrong side. Um, all this will feel okay. Yep, got a little bit of it. So we can see the different colors now. Um, salt line. Yeah, let me get this thing out of the way. Okay. Do, 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 do. Okay. So I would find the appropriate color. Uh, in this case, we're going to use some white paint. So, um, have you guys ever gotten the ring around the collar effect in your washes? Uh, if you have, what happened is you had a pool of paint sit someplace for a little while. And what happens is, actually, we're going to switch over to my whiteboard. So, switching over to the whiteboard. So I'm not cutting anything. Clear whiteboard. Um, so if I had a bubble of paint sitting on the surface of my painted figure, so this is just a wash that didn't get laid down right. Uh, what happens is, can I change my color? Yes, I can change my color. Oh, doggy. It's like I'm high tech or something here. Um, so what happens is that bubble is actually drying from the outside edge first and taking all those little pigments in the paint and pulling them to the edge as this starts to dry on out. Everyone with me so far?
So if I want a good thin line, if I leave a bubble of paint there, I let it dry and start depositing that pigment there. Let me go back to my scene. And I come back through with a dry brush and pick up the middle of that paint. Can you see what happens with that? So we get left with this kind of crusting or this ring around the color line. If I want something like a salt line, which the salt may double up, it's not the worst thing in the world for the salt to double one up. You're gonna focus, you're gonna focus. I can then take a wet brush. Well, wetter than I have. Oh, nope, that's not what I want to do. Put that on for too long. Um, a little firmer, a little shorter brush. Do, 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 do. So that's just too soft of a hair. A little firmer brush. I can come back in and with that damp brush, just erase out. So I get left with that salt line. And I can even just do it quick too if I want to by going back and forth over and making sure I'm using the tip of my brush. So what I'm doing here is having that kind of wash consistency. And I'm pressing down firm on the side of the brush and pulling back and forth. So that's all we want to run to the tip of the brush. So as I keep going back and forth, it's gonna refocus that into a more and more of a line. I might let all that dry on out. It's not a nice line, but it'd be very quick way of doing it. So you won't have that as hard edge of a line, but you get different places where the water um, and salt would pool for a little bit. And you'll get lots of little rings around the collar kind of marks out of it. Right. I definitely get that, but I sometimes try for aesthetically pleasing at the same time too. Maybe you want a harder line, you can actually just come back in and just start to come on top of it and make a more solid line out of it. But I mean, that's essentially how it's building up anyway. It's being re-exposed over and over and over again. That's why everyone has a crusty doorknob outside of their uh, shore house in Jersey. And then the salt air beats it on up versus the nice clean one on the inside of the house. Or I can just lay a nice long. Long pool. I can drain out and pull out a little middle lines and get everything out of it and leave that line, super thin line behind afterwards. So I will be honest, that trick I like to do with the really fine lines that way is actually one of my preferred ways of doing marble. Come on, camera. There we go. So I'll make some pools and some puddles, um, always with the directionality to it, and then erase some of it out again. Um, I get some real fine lines fairly quickly that way. Thank you. Um, so I'll actually do the tiles with a little bit of shading and directionality to them, and then come back and just make those real thin lines uh, coming into that way. Once you kind of, 
thins out a bit. You can just see how big that it really is. The fish are dead right now because there's no water in the pond, but you know, we'll get the water in there eventually. So we got dusting, we got some boats, which I'm glad about the boat question. I haven't been asked that one except at a historical show. Um, salt line was a new one though. Um, so we have running rust so we can pull things up and over. Um, um, so we have that kind of um, uh, dripping kind of rust and grime. Um, we did about faux battle damage, uh, weathering, uh, oil paints, weathering pigments, uh, weathering pencils. Um, um, if you guys uh, can think of more things you want to weather, I'll be more than happy to talk about how we can do some of those tricks and techniques. Um, but a lot of it comes down to be about playing with it and observing it. Um, um, I will really uh, tell you guys, I almost got arrested for taking pictures underneath a bridge in New York because it was fantastic weathering. Um, not quite as bad as the person in Jersey who was taking um, bird pictures way too close to a nuclear reactor. Um, but yeah, when you start seeing that stuff, you're going to start seeing how rust and weathering really sits. And there's two things you have to do with that. There is getting it to look right and getting it to be right. Um, both are have some degree of importance, but don't be afraid to, if you're picking one, get it looking right. Um, it may not be exactly what you want, what it would be in life, but there's a certain assumption that we're coming to with art um, that sometimes is more about satisfying what a person thinks things should be. Um, that's why things like the blue mud does not work out very well, but a red mud works out quite well. Um, heck, in the name of doing things right, or getting things looking right, uh, this is engine rust by secret weapon. Um, a lot of times I will actually glaze my flesh tones with this because um, I'll start losing my warmth to it and the salmon kind of color will pop it right back. So definitely feel free to play with what it takes to get you the right technique that you need it to be with. Any questions, anything I can help with, anything you want to see me do or a technique you want to see again. Yeah. Oh, I do apologize. I do want to show the salt weather, salt weathering technique real fast. I did prime this one up earlier um, and do it because it takes too long to dry without the airbrush. Um, so basically what I did before is I took the model. Okay. I have so much weathering pigment on my fingertips. I just weathered it with my fingertips. Okay. Um, so with that technique, I'm going to use a hairspray. I'm going to use a pigment fixer. I'm going to use matte medium. I want to put it down on the model first, and I'm going to drip the salt on top of it. And then with an airbrush or a spray of some type, I am going to sprinkle the salt on top of it. And then either with a tool or a fine needle, um, I use, a lot of times we'll use a sculpting tool. You can actually start to scrape the salt away. Um, and what happens is you'll start getting a little chips out of it as well. I'm hoping you guys can see what I'm talking about as far as like chipping goes. Um, I've done this with rattle cans before. So I've done a Bane Blade tank uh, for Maria because I know she does orc stuff. Um, so I painted the model on up. Um, I put a rust color underneath everything. I uh, put my salt down, painted the model on up, and then came back and knocked the salt off and I had rust chips to it. I want to be honest, I can do it much faster with blister foam. Um, but this actually gives a bit of depth to that layer very softly. 
Um, when you do it though, um, things to watch out for is don't use all the same salt. So if you only have a uh, table salt in the shaker or with the salt that you're using, all those chips are gonna be approximately the same size. Um, so what I actually have is a little shaker mixed with salt size crystals. So it has some sea salt to it. That's very hard to see this way. Um, so it has some sea salt to it, it has some table salt to it. Um, so I will give it a good shake up first. Um, the thing I wanna add to the mix now is some kosher salt. Um, I think I'll get some good flakes out of that one too. So don't be afraid to help make those different flakes and chips different sizes for it. Um, I don't think we talk about enough when you actually watch videos with uh, weathering to it. Um, you see salt weathering a lot, um, but they don't always do that. There are mediums um, such as chipping fluids and wearing effects. Um, a couple of different companies make it. This just happens to be AK. Um, basically, same thing. Um, you have to kind of know what you're doing with that model beforehand because um, I need to put the rust or the what the chip's going to become underneath. Um, and the reason why I don't like to teach that is because a lot of times I don't know what I want to do with the model, so I'm actually going for it. Um, however, if you know you want a certain effect, this might be a good method for you to use. Um, so in this scenario, if I wanted a red chip in my in my um, dumpsters here, I would have to prime the dumpster red. Um, I would put the worn effect next onto it. And then I would paint the dumpster the green color I want it to be. Um, and then I would come back through with the paintbrush and start brushing away. Um, this does very much like the, the Vaseline does on the wax paper. It makes it so the paint on top doesn't bond well to the model. So it's easier to peel off that way. Um, so you just kind of, you're lifting the paint and peeling it away. Um, so the advantage of that is you can leave that paint clumped up. Um, if you do leave it clumped up, um, it would give a more of a um, scraping kind of feel to it versus if you lift it away completely, then it gives more of a wearing kind of feel to it. Um, I find no difference between chipping fluid and wearing fluid. So it just depends on what you're doing with the brush. Uh, wearing fluid, wearing tends to be more linear. Uh, chips tend to be more in like a circular kind of line. Uh, so patina, um, actually let's grab a piece of patina that I can show. Uh, let's grab something newer. That'll work for me. So we must guys, I'm just stealing an image just so we can use it to discuss at the same time. And I am going to add it to my source. Actually, let's do this a little different. I don't want Reaper to get in trouble for what photo I'm using. We'll use a photo that no one can argue with. We're just using this for discussion purposes. It can be. We'll talk about the heat barrel portion of things. Uh, so we're talking about patina like this, or are you talking about something a little bit more worn, um, more a uh, Statue of Liberty, like it's kind of all green or in the process of patining, like this, like this Cupid is. Okay, so a couple different ways you can do it. 
Um, so you can burnish weathering pigments in. Um, you know, wait a point with my pointer one of these days. Um, so if you see the coloration on to it, it's actually just that superficial layer that's patining. Um, this one isn't old enough that it's gone through most of the material. Um, so I can actually take a green weathering pigment, uh, faded blue, faded green, <laughs> and then doing some burnishing methods into it. So I just take that brush and kind of scrub it into the effect of it. Um, with that in mind, make sure that places that are um, going to hold moisture or be more exposed to elements are going to uh, patina first. Um, while you see it all along that cupid's cheek, that's probably the side that's getting the most weather worn. But if you look at just around the nose piece um, on that same side, uh, I can almost guarantee you some moisture sitting there as well as the chipping on the forehead that's coming around for it. And you can see where the curls are holding that moisture at as well. Um, where the bigger, looser curl in the middle of the forehead is probably open enough that it's drawing out fast. Those tighter curls or those um, loopier kind of curls are saving more moisture, um, allowing them to oxidize a little faster for it. That's my favorite thing always, by the way, is the fact that the Statue of Liberty came to us as a, as a copper statue. Uh, so the heat barrel effect, um, there's a few materials that will actually do the heat barrel effect. Um, for our purposes in Secret Weapon, I would, that's your weapon, uh, Reaper, I would recommend doing the clears to do the effect. Um, clear magenta, clear red, and clear blue, um, and glaze them onto the barrel um, and see the heat effect build up that way. Um, um, I don't think you can beat a good glaze that way. There are materials out there specifically for that. Um, I think Seeker Weapon makes um, uh, heat colors, um, which I think are essentially just a clear magenta as well. Um, but they're in that color range that was designed for that heat on a gun barrel. Um, but that also tends to be on really big engines and really big gun barrels. Um, that's probably not something I would do on even like a normal machine gun. Um, but I, I would do that for something like the main battle cannon or something. Um, so it's got a little bit of size to it, you know what I mean? Yeah, and make a larger tanks, that kind of stuff. Um, if you know, you're, I still know you're doing orcs, so they, you know, an orcs holding a ridiculous gun, go for it. Um, and if you're comfortable airbrushing that, um, it's not a bad method to airbrush as well. Um, Cause you'll get that nice little clear effect across it fairly quickly. Um, and you still get your metal color underneath of it. And that's the biggest thing is you want the metal to still show and that color to kind of fade away. Um, and reference photos are fantastic for that just because you want to see how that color will change over time. And that really depends on what the metal is. Um, when things get heated up, they definitely go through different phases of colors and how that metal treats those colors is dependent on the metal portion of things. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm not going to run over. We're at four o'clock. Uh, at kind of just in Reaper time, three o'clock, correct? Yeah, you end in about ten minutes. Okay. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions you guys have for the next ten minutes. I do want to point out that I am constantly on the Discord. Um, I'm probably going to sit there and I'm going to get food and come back and sit in Discord for a little while. 
So I do have my uh, painter artist alley section. Um, throw up pictures you want me to talk about. Um, if you want me to do a review or give suggestions, please let me know that's what you're looking for. Um, uh, you know, if you just want me to show you what results you got from the class, fantastic. I love seeing that too. If you want me to give you feedback, please just let me know. Um, I try not to get feedback to when people don't are don't want it. Um, that's always a bummer to me at shows, so I try not to do that to people at shows. Uh, sometimes you just want to just appreciate the art versus uh, getting feedback. Uh, with that being said, if you go to my uh, artist alley section, um, I have a Facebook page. Um, I do make the paper plants. Um, so my Facebook page is for the paper plants and the Wicked Elf miniatures. Um, however, I do have an Instagram that I show the art off of at. Um, I also stream on Fridays and Sundays. Uh, Fridays on Twitch tends to be more of uh, bust and, and competition figures. And then Sundays tend to be more about skirmish figures and just relaxing and painting and having fun. Um, Marie likes to pop in onto that one occasionally too. So is there anything else of your stuff I can make dirty in the next nine minutes? And the reason why I call this class dirty and distressed is because usually at conventions I'm dirty and distressed. What about like um, a plasma blast or something since we're doing like a Reaper virtual kind of cyberpunk situation? Okay. Uh, so actually I would go back for glazing for that and fantastic colors for that for um, um, is magentas, purples, uh, because you tend to see like reds and blues for that portion of things. So if I was doing something plasma based, the clear magenta, be a good color for it um, or clear blue. If you happen to have the phyllo colors, uh, which I hoping would um, come out and get released one day, um, those would also be excellent colors as well. Sorry, we had a little lag. So if you were no. talking to me, I didn't hear you. <laughs> oh, no problem. Um, so colors like the magentas and purples, and if we ever have one of the phyllo colors, release for a major release one day, that'd be great. Um, but just doing a nice glaze of those colors. Because magenta is such an unnatural color we find a lot of times. Um, paint that glaze on top of uh, plasma blasters or pistols or that kind of stuff. Um, just to make that metal heat a different color uh, would be a good way to kind of make something feel like unnatural or that cyber portion of things um, around glasses um, I'm trying to think what super sci-fi thing I have on my desk right now. I don't have a big sci-fi thing on my desk. Um, actually, I kind of do. So this is a uh, mono wheel, uh, but on the inside of it, you guys can see the. I uh, hope you guys can see the monitors for the rider on the inside of it. So where these lines are at for the different monitors, I'm probably going to glaze in a super bright blue and let that sit there. So there's less of a weathering, but more of making something seem unnatural or lighted, lighted, lighted um, glowing, um, which is a good way just to kind of get that effect that it's something different. It's not the normal thing. It's not a piece of metal. It's not a piece of steel. Um, I hope that answers the question that you're looking for. By the way, talking about um, guns on this thing. Uh, it's a Rathcore holder. I'm not sure how this person is going to fire this thing. Without being dragged back, it's getting this thing rolled. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Yeah, 
this. So, yep, and give me a few minutes. I'll actually be back into the Discord groups. Um, if not, in my um, handout, um, there's my email. It's wickedelf.miniatures um, at gmail.com or wickedelf.neolas at gmail.com. Um, those are the only emails that go to my phone. Um, so even when I'm treating on a particular day, um, when I get an email off those emails, I know it's something fun about painting. Um, you're more than free to message me about how I would do an ID or to do review or feedback. Um, I would love, I love that. It makes my day go by quicker um, and it's always appreciated. Thank you guys for attending. I hope you have a good show. I probably can start stop recording from this point.